Right. Good afternoon and thank you for coming to the January meeting uh, of Connecticut State Community College Senate. Uh, it is 1231. The recording has started and I'm calling the meeting to order. Our first order of business is a welcome. So thank you for being here. Um, Alan, it was really nice to hear your advocacy with the governor. I think that dovetails uh, very nicely with the resolution that we have asked each of the campuses to consider. I, I wanna um, bring to your attention a couple of things that, of questions um, that I've received from that. And the first is, which governance body matters from the campuses? And this got really complex because all governance at the campus, campus level matters, but every campus has a different structure and ultimately, it is that campus wide governance that we are counting for this purpose. So that is my understanding of what our intent was. If you folks have a different understanding, I think we should add that as a subsequent agenda item. Uh, it's not to diminish the other pieces of governance on the campus, but in order to to register a single uh, piece from each campus. I think that is important. Let's see whose hand is up. Peter, I see your hand. No, okay. I do. I do see Peter's hand, but um, he is not speaking. So thank you for that. Um, the other thing I want to let everyone know is that late Wednesday, we received a response on the framework. Uh, we didn't as an executive council, we didn't get to to really read it and try to understand it until Thursday and we do not understand it. it. It They took what we asked for and turned it into something that doesn't really translate well, but none of us have had the, the chance to talk about it. So what we would like to do is we're going to have a conversation next week about that framework but we want you to participate. So when we set our meeting, we will share it with all of the senators and invite you to participate if you can, okay? Um, I know there's going to be a request that says, hey, can you share what they gave you? Could we? Yes. Will we? No. Because they took a formula, to, <laughs> thank you for that smile, Alan. I appreciate that. Um, because they took a formula that we applied to nine meetings and they really changed the way they were allotting hours. It so bastardized what we intended that it doesn't, it won't make sense to someone reading it. Now, I will say that administration has said, we know that this may not have worked and they're receptive. So, so that is a complicated way of saying we are going to invite you to participate in that conversation. And as soon as we have a date set, we will share it with you, okay? And then the last thing I want to share is, as I have been talking to folks in the system, well, in the system and outside the system, um, I did not have a chance to talk to the governor as Alan did from Gateway, but as I am talking to folks about governance, I am reminding everyone every chance I get, that we have an opportunity. Governance is new, and what we are trying to do is not just identify the problems, but also solutions. The folks who created the system, they didn't see the blind spots. They didn't know about the nuances that we now see as possible problems. So it's not just about the problems, it's about the solutions. And, you know, for some people, we just have to say, can, can you at least just step aside and let us try to solve the problems? We all know and, and deal with the people who are just kind of standing in the way, right? But there are enough of us who want to solve the problems that we can do that if, when, when and if we take that opportunity. So if you are having a meeting on your campus and it would help to have me participate, please invite me. Let's have more of those conversations because 
we it's not a one size fits all it's not this is going to work this time governance is a is is democracy and it's always a matter of fine tuning what we're doing so with that i want to welcome you all to the january meeting and ask if there are any changes to our agenda Well, I just have one quick question. Are, it's there. Are we voting yep. today on that resolution? Uh, I, I, I don't know, and I'm just realizing, did we, did I put it back on the agenda there? Um, I could be looking at an, uh, at something else. Oh, Alan popped his hand up. Maybe he has something to say. Alan, go ahead. Uh, I, I don't see it on the agenda. Okay, so my I, bad I, was, then. I, I apologize. I was I was going to ask because I just printed out whatever was on SharePoint. So I was Great. going to ask if we could discuss it and perhaps that would during that discussion, we could also, uh, if, if wanted, we could also go into the, which, which governance body, uh, is would register. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on each campus. That Great. Tie, so tie together. Ellen, I have, I have added that as. Um, old business letter C. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan and Thayer. Any other changes to the agenda? Is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? I, I see Roberta. Is motion there a second? To, motion to approve as amended, yep. Thank you, Roberta. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, thank you, Lisa. All those in, uh, are there any objections? Are there any objections? With that objection, we have a, an approved amended agenda. Wow, that was hard. Uh, the approved the December minutes. We did not receive anything at the CO College Senate. Are there any changes? or amendments to the December minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from December? I'll make that motion. Thank you, John. And a second? I'll second. Thank you. Who who was was that Peter? Peter was Bennett, that you? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, sir. Any objections or abstentions? I wasn't at the December meeting, so I feel I should abstain. An abstention. Thank you, Lisa. So we have one abstention. Any objections or other abstentions? So we have one abstention and the minutes are approved. All right, we are moving on. I just want to stop for a moment and say that um, uh, in working with CEO Hynek the last couple of weeks, um, I shared with her the link to the meeting and Karen, it looks like a number of CEOs have, have joined. And I think that is, that is due to your advocacy and helping. So, um, thank you to all of the CEOs who are joining us today. And with that, I will turn the meeting over and say, President Maduco, welcome back. Did you take a break? Uh, in theory, I, I, I took a break. I'm ecstatic, ecstatic to be back based on the, based on the look in my face. But uh, happy uh, New Year, everyone. Good seeing you all. Um, um, it's always good for our faculty um, to return. So we have a full team. Um, I was off for two weeks, but you know, you know, Connecticut's the land of. Uh, Never a dull moment. So, so now we're here. Um, so, for starters, uh, uh, Professor Vandermark, good to see you. Appreciate your leadership and everything, keeping us on task. Just some brief high level updates. So, obviously, we're in the new year. Uh, I want to bring to everyone's attention. Um, we haven't ironed out the date yet, but in spring of 2025, we will have our comprehensive site visit um, from Nechi, right? So, like, that's going to, that, that's a big deal. Um, Nechi is still trying to figure out how they're going to do the site visit because they, you know, we are going to be historic for Nechi because they've never done a statewide 
a site visit before. So, so net chief having uh, chest palpitations in terms of like, what in the bleep are they going to do? Right? So, you know, we're coordinating, but we're looking forward to that. And um, we're going to put together a team. Uh, we're working with the college Senate kind of put together a college wide team um, as it relates to the preparation and, and the pre work that we have to do um, for that for that visit. So, once we iron out a date, um, we will um, be sure to get that information out to our college community. Um, I think beginning next week, um, and, and at least for the next 6 weeks, we'll be having legislative breakfasts, um, across our campus, across our 12 main campuses, um, the opportunity for, um, members of our general assembly, um, to, to meet with us on our campuses, um, learn about some student success highlights, learn about our, our needs and obviously, you know, our concerns as it relates to our budget. So, um, we are, I, I believe we have the dates, um, except for three rivers. I know three rivers needs to reschedule their date. Um, but we're working on that. We'll make sure that our camp, our respective campus communities, um, are aware with it. Um, we're working on the agenda. We're working on a slide deck and, and talking points in terms of. Okay, you know, we're CT state. Who are we? And I think it's really important. Um, beginning with me that we make sure that we get our fast facts. And our talking points out to our college community. So to our college community. So just a couple things. For example, ninety-eight percent of our students are, are residents of Connecticut, right? I don't think there's any other institution higher ed in Connecticut that can say that, right? Like that's that's a big part of our value proposition that we actually educate the state. Um, you know, next, sixty-seven percent of our students are first-generation college students, right? So two so two-thirds of our students, right? So that, that's a huge celebration that, you know, you know, these individuals, our students are beginning their post secondary educational experience with us, right? Something to celebrate. I want to say we're hovering around 60% of our students are students of color, right? We're, we're, we're trying to double check and make sure that's right. I know, I, I, I knew that we were at the 50% mark, 60% is high, um, but nonetheless, you know, a high percentage of our students, um, are of color, 51% um, of our students attend CT state tuition and fee free, right? So remember, we serve north of 40,000 credit students, give or take a year, right? So about 20,000 students annually attend CT state at no cost at all. That's a combination of Pell, it's a combination of PACT, and a combination of the, of the great um, the scholarships that we receive that are provided from our 12 great foundations. Um, and then last but not least, um, 8,000 students, dual enrolled students we served last year. So 8,000 high school students um, were duly enrolled in our courses um, at CT State, you know, last year. And that represents about 27 to 30% of all dual enrollment opportunities in the state of Connecticut, right? Another value proposition in terms of what we're bringing to the table. And then we have some preliminary uh, student success metrics. So Fall the spring retention rates for first time full time students is hovering around 83%. Right? So 83% of our first time full time students statewide and credit based programming, right, are being retained at 83%. That's a testament to our great faculty and staff and, and what we do day in and day out, despite the nonsense, despite the stuff that we have to deal with. And I think our retention rate is about 71% for all credit students. Regard, regardless of their status, full time, part time, first time, et cetera. High percentage rate, right? That, that ranks up there with the other New England community colleges. And then lastly, I believe from 2022 to 2023, we've seen a 6% uh, increase in retention for African American males, right? So the, so the very things that are thrown our way and that we're not doing well, right? Like we're seeing improvements, we're seeing high marks. and. We got to make sure that we're putting that out there when we're engaging with our legislators, our community, and our partner to counter the narrative that I know has been out there for such a long time that we had 12 broken colleges and now we're just one big broken college. That's that's never been the case, right? We're doing great work despite our challenges, despite the barriers that have been placed on us. So just want to kind of share that with you off the top of my head. We will we're working on finalizing our fast facts. Uh, crunching the numbers, making sure that they're verifiable and accurate, and then publishing that not only online, um, but um, but distributing these fast facts, um, one page or two pages across the campuses 
uh, for people to distribute to their respective um, stakeholders and, part and partners internally and externally. So I wanted to mention that um, last week at the State of the College um, session that we had, you know, I had mentioned, um, you know, the 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 equity challenges that we are uh, we're facing. Uh, I think nationally, right? And I think that we though there's still a lot of work to be done here in Connecticut and within our institution and across our campuses. Um, you know, it's it's a lot worse in other parts of the country, right? So I mentioned Florida. And, and how they've really removed and defunded it, DEI anything um, in their public institutions, they've also gotten rid of so sociology, right? So any of you that are sociology faculty, or, and again, we love our sociology faculty um, across our campuses, they've gotten rid of sociology, you know, for their community colleges slash state colleges. Like that's the type of nonsense that's going on in our country right now, right? And it really needs to remind us uh, the importance of freedom of speech and academic freedom and how that, not just our faculty, but all of us have to be advocates and stewards of that, of those principles, right? Uh, that gives our students the opportunity and freedom and the liberty to learn and, and they hear different perspectives. Um, so again, just, just really concerning that we're seeing that uh, go around the country. And, and that means that we have to dig our heels and do even more to combat that and make sure that we're instilling in our students the importance of higher education, but that our faculty feel supported from all of us that we have your back. We have the back of the faculty when it comes to their academic freedom and their liberties in terms of how they teach, from what scope, from what materials, et cetera. I think that's really important. I think we need to remind our colleagues um, college-wide of what that means. Now, in terms of going into the spring semester, now I have seven minutes left. I don't think I wanna use the seven minutes. I wanna uh, probably leave five minutes for questions. Um, but heading you know, into our, you know, our spring semester, you know, there are you know, a bunch of fires we're still putting out. Um, so we absolutely welcome uh, the suggestions um, and the solutions that our faculty and staff or leaders are bringing to the table. That's, that's, uh, it's evident um, that senior administration, we don't see everything, nor do we know everything, right? So we want um, the partnership of our colleagues and our great colleagues across, uh, across our college. Um, I think, too, um, we are, um, I, I believe, the student activities directors, I know career services, um, some of these things are on our to-do list to engage, um, you know, with our colleagues and professionals and experts about, okay, what would, what, what would those areas look like? What level of support do they need? Where, what, what have been the challenges um, that are making it difficult to provide those levels of support to our students? And how do we formulate some strategies, you know, college-wide? I know the Department of Labor has, has, has contacted me in terms of, hey, we have resources that we would love to share and, and provide to CT State. But I think before we even engage and agree to anything, we need to assess um, internally what does that look like in terms of our needs. And, and I know it's been difficult. I know it's not equal uh, between our campuses when it comes to student activities and also career services. But I recognize those areas are very important um, and we need to speak to that. Um, last but not least, um, I'll touch on budget, but obviously Carrie carries on here. Um, so um, still getting questions from everyone. So from legislators to our own um, leaders internally, uh, you know, among the ranks, you know, of our union and our faculty and our staff, our campus CEOs and our VP centrally, in terms of you know what to do about our you know our deficit and what are we going to do and do I feel um, any level of hope um, um, on this pending and upcoming legislative session. Um, I will, I will refrain to uh, refer to hope, um, but I know we're going to be loud. And I know we're going to advocate to the best of our ability uh, when it comes to the funding that we need, not only to operate, but the funding we need to thrive and do the, do the good work that I know we can do. Uh, but I think we have to brace ourselves for, for divorce. Um, and what that is, don't know yet, right? Um, and, and we need to sit down and kind of um, map that out, but there's no decisions have been made. Right, and and people have asked me about layoffs, and in, in our, I mean, layoffs, at, layoffs at, at any moment um, is not good, is not great. But in our infancy, right, when we're trying to just stand this thing called CT State up, um, you know, it would be beyond demoralizing, right? Right, it would it would cripple us, um, and I don't want to do that. And I don't want to see that happen to any of our colleagues who work hard. 
and then kill themselves um, for the needs of our students and for the needs of each other and our institutions and campuses. So we're still working through that. Um, we welcome the question. We welcome if things don't seem right, um, how we can further break it down. Um, you know, Carrie and I and our leaders are committed to transparency and making sure that everyone has the facts and also too, if we're missing something, hey, then we'll go back to the drawing board and, and reassess to make sure people feel that they at least have, um, you know, the numbers uh, that speak to our structural um, deficit. Um, and then last but not least, hey, happy new year. We're in, we're in this new year, right? We have six plus months under our belt as TT state. I know I have gray in my beard and I, I am bald, right? Because, because of it, I think I had a full head of hair when I got hired. So absolutely this thing has been traumatic, but nonetheless, we are doing great things. Um, and even yesterday at the press conference at Gateway and Alan, uh, Professor Ballinger, a shout out to you for speaking up and speaking your truth to the budget, uh, to the governor, right? You didn't mention any words. Um, but our students at that presser were celebrating their faculty, right? They kept on echoing our faculty do so much, our staff do so much. And I'm, I'm proud that we continue to do that despite what's going on. So three minutes um, left. I'll stop um, yapping and, and turn the floor to everyone if you have any specific questions for me. Hi, can you see my hand up? Yeah, yeah, it was just taking me a minute. Go ahead, Angelo. Okay, hi, thank you, President Maduco, for your report. It's always interesting to hear you talking about what was where we're going. I have a question about the equity you mentioned before. Uh, you said that um, things are worse in other parts of the country uh, due to the fact that uh, sociology uh, has been getting rid of in so many colleges. Can you share uh, more information about that? Because as a, a former chair of the Culture Awareness Committee, I'm really interested in, in, in this topic. Yeah, so it's not happening here in Connecticut. Let me make that clear. But in the state of Florida, just Google Florida plus higher education, and either you're going to see the picture of the devil or just going to be links upon links of all the stuff that's going on. But, you know, they have pulled sociology, right? Like the subject and topic of sociology. Um, their state department of education from their state colleges, right? Uh, in addition to obviously their banning of anything related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, not only the departments, but also the personnel in those departments and the funding that have been supporting those individuals for, for some time, right? So our colleagues in Florida uh, in the public higher education space are definitely reeling. Um, you know, I know of colleagues who are personal friends of mine who have just left and left their roles, uh, you know, the, the, now, the now former president of Broward College, the minute the governor DeSantis um, removed the board member and placed a board member of his liking, he walked out. He said, I'm done. I can't, I can't do this. So that's what's going on, not only in Florida, but other parts of the country. Thank you so much. Yep. All right, if you are a senator, I'm going to remind you to please add SEN to the beginning of your name. Uh, this this permits us to be able to count your votes. Uh, it also changes the order of participants so that we know who we are calling upon. So uh, I noticed a couple of names do a couple of our senators do not have that on their handle yet. Uh, any other questions for President Maduco? All right, thank you very much, sir. And with that, we are going to uh, move on to Vice President John Paul. John Paul, can you say your, your last name for me, please? Absolutely. My last name is Chasson Carmenas, and that's the one and only time you'll probably hear it, and you never have to use it again. So the John awesome. Paul is perfect for me. Don't worry. Nobody actually knows my last name. Okay, well, with that, I would like to welcome you to Senate and you wanted to address the Senate today. So the floor is yours, sir. I just wanted to take the opportunity to meet uh, some of you uh, who I have not met. I've been to your campuses many times before, uh, but you know, you don't always catch people at the right time. So I wanted to put my face with some of kind of the things that are going on uh, when it comes to equity, inclusion, diversity at CT State. One great example is today we have uh, roughly 70 people here at New Britain who are either Muslim and Arabs, 
and they are these are faculty and staff, and they are working on creation uh, a, a, a student faculty uh, 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 affinity group. Uh, because of something we haven't had, we've made the same type of offers to other communities, including the Jewish community. We're working with the ADL to do that, and we'll continue to do that. Um, but it's just an example of what we're doing. Um, I will tell you right off the bat, I'm not the guy for flashy one time events. I'm really about structures and systems. And so that's what I've been concentrating on doing and making sure that the right voices are actually speaking and not always speaking. However, today I do have an ask for this committee. As you know, and Dr. Maduko referred to earlier, uh, we are in the midst of becoming both a majority minority university, uh, or system, I'm sorry, uh, and a Hispanic serving institution. Uh, it will be over the next few years that we will be moving what right now is our individual campuses to that system, depending on, and I'll be very clear, if we can get more money uh, from, the, from, the, from the federal government by keeping the Hispanic serving institution at the campus level, we will do that. If we can get more money by doing a combination, we will do that. And if we can get more money um, by simply bringing it up to the city state level and the whole system becomes that, we will do that. So there's a very practical, practical issue behind that. But there's also a philosophical issue behind that, which is what does it mean for us to be a minority serving institution, really where our students are of color and other underrepresented minorities uh, or groups or, or people of color. And so that's what we are really looking at, that transformation. To me, this is gonna be a transformation that we have to do not only in how we operate and do business, but also on how we think. In order to facilitate that process, and I'm putting a link right now in the chat box, uh, I have been working with um, Dr. Terry Brown uh, on, on bringing uh, some speakers to campus who can talk meaningfully about what's going on at the national level with Hispanic serving institutions. And because I truly believe that as we go and start moving towards um, uh, and of that positioning, we have to be faithful to what that means. And so uh, my offer to you, if you choose to accept, and I, I already have a couple other partners in there. One is the diversity inclusion, the DEI committee for the curriculum Congress has said they would like to partner with us. And I am offering to you uh, that if I bring Gina Garcia on April, it, notice a Monday. And so it's not your standard Friday where everybody can be there. Um, I will pay for her to be here for you all, the faculty senate and the curriculum DEI committee to be able to use her however you feel is appropriate in order to get to faculty. She will already be here in the morning talking to leadership and the deans and all of those folks. But I truly believe that this work really needs to start from the bottom up. And so the, the, the meaningfulness of it really has to happen at that time. So um, this is my app. Please consider um, you know, now that we're bringing this wonderful speaker uh, who can really talk and, you know, she really quite literally wrote the book or books in this area, right? Um, to figure out an event how we can engage faculty and staff from across the system. I will do whatever on the labor side that needs to be done, but I need your brains and leadership in order to do this right. Does that make sense? And then after that, um, I'm just going to leave a couple of minutes. If you want to ask me any questions about the EI, I'm open to answer those, but I just wanted to put that ask in front of you and then give you a few minutes to ask questions or anything. Thank you. Thank you, John Paul. Uh, very quickly, she, you, you are bringing her to where? Where will she be in the morning? In the morning, she will be most likely at New Britain, but we have, we're have we having a conversation with the cabinet and others that if you want to have her at a specific campus, we would probably move that particular meeting 
um, to or or that are particularly to that campus, so we can just have her in one space. So there's a lot of flexibility at this point on how we do it. Okay, thank you, uh, Sandy, and then Nicola. Hello, Dr. John Paul. Um, my name is Sandra Vitali, and currently I'm the campus supervisor of financial aid at Tunksis. I am so grateful to hear you finally say these words. I've been trying to get Tunksis on board for years. I would be willing to assist in any way to get the speaker so people can hear her. Just from what I see with the Spanish speaking population, we need this. We've needed it for years. It's a plus for us. And like I said, I'm on board. Sandra, are you making a motion to co-sponsor this with the, the curriculum, the DEI curriculum committee? I would, I would like to make a motion. I absolutely believe in it. We need it. Absolutely. Thank you. Before I go to Nicola, is there a second to this motion? Bonnie, Bonnie has seconded. Thank you, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Nicola, the floor is yours. Hi, John Paul, thank you for being here. Um, is this offer being opened up to all faculty? I just want to be, I want clarity for my notes or is it, um, are you thinking just for Senate and curriculum? Thank you. Oh, well, I think for anybody who wants to be there, I, I really think that this work needs to be from, done from the bottom up. And so what I'm asking the Senate is to help me think about how we can get it as wide and broad to all our faculty staff um, as possible. You all are the experts in how to do that. Um, I have some expertise in this particular area with many serving institutions, and I can bring some resources to there. But the reality is that uh, it does mean a cultural transformation. So that's all of us, all of us at CT State, right? And if you want to extend it to students, I'm perfectly okay with that, but that would be your decision uh, to do because you are in many ways, the people who help us find the pathways forward. Any other questions before we move to a vote? Okay. All those in favor of co-sponsoring this event with the DEI Committee from Curriculum Congress, please raise your hands now. All those in support, please raise your hands now. Uh, if we accept this, folks, we're going to need a few people to, not with Sandra, thank you, uh, a few people to lead on it and uh, help, help plan. So that, that ask will be coming next. John, how many hands do we have? Uh, it's still still changing. Okay. Thirty one. Thirty one in favor. All right, folks, go ahead and lower your hands. Go ahead and lower your hands. Any opposed? Any opposed? Two opposed. Two opposed. Thank you. Go ahead and lower your hands. Any abstentions? Two abstentions. And two abstention. The motion carries. Having voted to collaborate, are there any volunteers? I'm, I'm sorry, L. Go L. Yes, it, the going back to the votes, I think um, one of the posing votes was just the hand sticking up from the previous. Oh, so. it hadn't come down. Oh, that was me. I was having problems getting my hand down. My computer's not liking me today. I apologize. Okay, so so I, we're adjusting that to one one opposed. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that. So, folks, if you could raise your hand, if you would like to be um, on this. It's not an official committee, but if you would like to work on this event, how about that? If you would like to work on this event. So let's see, uh, Norley, Ariel, Sandra, and Bonnie. 
Sarah, and Thayer. So those are the names that we have. Nora, Nora, that would be my granddaughter. Norley, Ariel, Sandra, Bonnie, Sarah, and Thayer. If, I'm sorry, Alex, because I cannot uh, lower my hands. I'm on my cell phone. So I'm trying to do that. I, I can take I, care I of it. I will go to uh, to strip or that. Okay, thank you, Norley. Uh, if you decide you would like to participate later, just send me an email, uh, preferably CO College Senate, but you can also send it to me and we will connect you with that group. And for those of you who have already uh, volunteered, we will, we will get that task force started early next, next week, joining you with John Paul and the DEI folks. So thank you very much. Norley, did you have another question or comment? I'm going to assume no, because I haven't, I have, I'm not I don't think it. he can get his hand down because he's on his phone. Uh, technical challenge. There we go. I, I took care of that, Brian, but there we go. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, thank you very much, John Paul. Uh, and with that. Thank you, well, thank you so much. And I'll be listening because I am always interested in your stuff. And thank you for letting me speak to the group. And I am very honored to have done so. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. All right, folks. Uh, with this, we are moving on to our first item of old business, which is course caps and cancellations. Who will be leading that? Peter, is it you or Angelo or Asanto or all of you? I'm guessing all of us. Okay, the floor is yours. Well, we had a meeting last time. Uh, we actually reported on the last Senate meeting uh, about what we have been discussing and uh, we left a uh, meeting on, um, early in February, uh, and we're going to have some new uh, colleagues joining us, uh, including Michael and a faculty from Texas. And I don't remember right now her name, but uh, once I look at my notes, I'll be notifying her as well. Peter, that's all I have for now. Am I right? Uh, yes, I, I think that. Um... Having gotten some comments back, I think we can say that we were trying to um, to solve a very complex problem. And I think what we were really trying to do was establish some general guidelines. Um, you know, hopefully that they, they, they would pass, but certainly general guidelines that we could start viewing the course caps and cancellations um, in in those in the perspective of those guidelines, and um, of course one was that uh, introductory classes uh, that have large amounts of co corrections, math, basic math and English would be capped at twenty. Although I know some of them at some campuses are now capped at eighteen, but um, I think we could expand um, uh, the the courses there, and um, the other thing was. Uh, not canceling classes until uh, approximately two weeks before the uh, semester begins. I know that uh, there was some objection to that because it, it suggested that students wouldn't have enough time to uh, scramble and get other classes. Um, uh, so, so that was um, uh, another issue. So I think that um, the, the final thing we wanted to do was to try to make a little more equitable the, the kind of loads that the faculty um, are teaching at the different campuses. And I realized because of the disparities in the size of the campuses, uh, this is, uh, needs to be um, set up with very general guidelines. So those are the things we looked at. Uh, I don't think we said absolutely that um, this must be the final version. Would have been nice if it had been accepted that way, but um, I'm more than happy to expand the committee, which I think we need to do to get other voices in and also to uh, uh, provide maybe more um, workable guidelines for every campus 
rather than just uh, the ones we represented. So uh, that's what I'd like to say. Um, and um, I want to thank uh, those of you who uh, did make suggestions um, based on our uh, proposal. So, Peter, at this time, is, you're asking for more folks to participate. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So, are there folks who are willing and able, willing and able to join this? I think you y'all have been calling yourselves a task force. Is that right? Yep, I see a yeah. sign. Are there are there folks who are willing and able to participate in this conversation? If you if you're interested, if you could please raise your hand. We don't bite, but we don't serve coffee either. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> and these meetings are online, by the way. We yeah. we don't um, meet um, on, in on campus or stuff like that. So I see Alan's hand. Alan, I've captured your name. Thank you. So um, what we'll do, uh, Course Caps Task Force, is if there are folks from the campuses who are interested, are you also willing to have them join and, and talk with you, Asantwa? Yeah, my, my, the initial um, thing came from another, a colleague of mine. So I will, I, I, I meant to, sort of get him in on this meeting, but we just haven't had another Senate meeting since we sent our first draft, I would say, <laughs> to you guys. Um, so we haven't had the campus Senate meeting. So once we, um, you know, have the meeting, I'll, I'll, I'll check to see if other folks, especially the people who drafted the resolution, um, would be involved. Are, are you, which resolution are you talking about? So this task force came about from a re two resolutions that were sent from right. our campus. Okay. <laughs> so. but, but now, but we're having a Senate conversation, right? A CT State Senate. Yeah, a CT State. So, I'm sorry. When I say CT State, I mean my campus Senate. I, the members who drafted okay. this resolution from campus Senate, I'll ask if they would like to have some input, at least show them the resolution if this is in the spirit of what they were intending in the first place. Okay, great. So um, I will I will add this I will add this to our follow up email and solicit some more um, some more bodies some more voices for you folks so that we can move this along. Alan, do you have a question or is your hand still up for participation? I uh, I put my hand back up because I okay. do have a question. Thank you. Um, so it, it is has the resolution. Or this is the status of this changing? Is it still in the original form? Um, what's the status? I guess relevant. I re I remember seeing those resolutions. I don't know if I still have a copy, although it's probably up on SharePoint. It will be in the SharePoint, Alan. Okay. Um, and, and officially, nothing has changed. Although Asantwa, you might have additional information as to what is happening at. Housatonic, is that right? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have any <laughs> information about what's happening at Housatonic, but they, the resolutions are on the SharePoint. And I think initially what we wanted to do was craft the resolutions to be more generalized for CT State. So we, we actually haven't done that actual thing, um, but sort of yeah. drifted into kind of come up with this policy. Yeah. So, so originally it was Asanta, Wa, Peter, and I, they're like, you know, uh, answer to Alan's question uh, that we were, we got together and put together a proposal. I, unfortunately, in a way, we didn't have representatives coming from different branches of the system. Uh, that is why I'm definitely welcoming Michael, wanted to be part of this, and including Ryan as well, who I know uh, personally, and it, I think is an incredible addition to to this this task force. So that we're going to be eventually putting crafting and putting together a very comprehensive and uh, I would say uh, reasonable uh, proposal to be presented to the Senate whenever it's going to be done or ready to be voted on. Okay, thank you for thank that. You. Any other questions before we move on? It's Nicola, real quick. Um, if I'm able to find people who are interested from Three Rivers, who do you want me to reach, let them reach out to? Peter me. or? Go ahead and send it to me, and then I'll put all the names together and, and push it out okay. so that we have, so that we know who's serving. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
All right. Moving on to the student handbook. Alan, that is you, sir. Well, I think we specifically brought this um, issue up with respect to the grade appeal process. And um, uh, as a result of, I think, you know, init initiating that, uh, Mike uh, really addressed it. Uh, he and I corresponded a little bit since the December meeting as well. I had a couple of suggestions, additional suggestions. So I believe that um, that particular issue has been addressed, that the campus bodies, uh, at, at least certainly on our, on our campus, because I made sure that they, they knew, um, are aware of the new policy, that the form for students is available to students where all student forms are. Um, uh, also, uh, it's available for faculty. So, um, yeah, I believe, you know, those particular issues were addressed. Um, I think I also made a, a suggestion about, a, was it the grade change form being on that faculty page? I don't know if that has, has happened yet or not. Um, but there were some other concerns about the, the, um, handbook that I'm maybe not as aware of, um, and I'm not sure the status of those. So. Okay. But, but the issue you brought, you feel is satisfactorily resolved for the time being. Right. Can I just defer to, uh, my colleague, Roberta, cause you're also on the, uh, the same committee that hears, uh, great appeals. So you're pretty much aware of it. Yeah, sure. I think I think the issues that were initially most concerning to the folks on the committee and to our FSC have been addressed. There's a few outstanding things, but they're gonna they're gonna have to take a little bit of time because they are the you know the structure of the process was developed when um, we had a different organizational structure. So now that department chairs are back in the mix, we may need to revisit that. But I've also discussed with Michael how to how to move that through. And I think there's a good plan in place so that the administrative, excuse me, the academic deans can discuss that and then bring it back around. I think Great. we're good. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you folks. And our next item is the CT state resolution on the board of regents and CSCU budget remediation. Um, that was an, a late add to our agenda. So, Thayer, do you want to start with that? Thayer and Alan, I want to just hand that off to you to see if you want to start that conversation. Um, hi, Al. It's there, obviously. <laughs> I was just um, bringing forth the conversation of I didn't want to make sure that we weren't uh, officially voting on anything today because I feel like it is really important for us to speak to everyone on our campus. And with us just getting back, I want to make sure that we're reaching out to everyone on our campus and just not one particular body because this is a big decision and a big item to back. And I want to make sure that all voices are being heard on all campuses. And that was my main thing is I wanted to make sure that everyone was having a voice. So, um, I think to your point there, a, mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of senators responded saying. Our governance body hasn't met since the last time Senate met, so we haven't had an opportunity. Correct. So, and that was my concern was, and you know, that from Ms. Nuntuck, we aren't meeting until, uh, in another week and I wanted to make sure that everyone had a voice. That was my concern. Great. Thank you. Any other. Any other thoughts there? It, it, it was not up for resolution or for voting to be clear. Uh, because for, for that very reason, Alan. Thanks. Well, I, I think you had uh, asked the question at the beginning of the meeting about. The appropriate governance body uh, at each campus. Being involved, and I think in our own correspondence. Um, we had, uh, because we had initially brought forth the, uh, FAC resolution, but it's. It is slightly different as you said, this does specifically. Hold the board of regents and, uh, chancellor Cheng, um, responsible. And, um, 
So uh, our faculty staff council is our primary governance body. So even though I could have brought it up with just the faculty at our meeting yesterday, I think you suggested it should be the primary governance body. So, um, and that is, uh, I imagine different at, on every campus. Every so we, campus. we won't be able, yeah, we won't be able to get to it until February, mid-February, but we will. Thank you. So th this issue of governance um, and which body do we record? Bonnie, I see your hand and I'll come to you next. Um, this is not the first time that that the issue of wh who, which governance body speaks for the campus, it has come up that, that we have tried to, or that we have grappled with in, in different forms and formats. Um, some, some campuses have three or four different governance bodies and, and we, and, and all of them are not equal, right? Some of them are, are only faculty. Some of them are faculty and staff. Some of them are only staff. And so I, it might be time because this issue keeps coming up to formally either, um, well, to formally address this issue. Bonnie, you were next. Um, thank you. Um, I have to agree with Bayer in regards to um, being able to, to tag everybody. I think there is also a lot of material that we could not um, digest in the sense that the feedback that I did receive, that there was a lot of information, a lot of questions, and they didn't know where, where to go for some of these questions when the topic um, was brought up. And so to really do due diligence, I think <laughs> I think more time to really be able to have these conversations, but also maybe even a suggestions to combine some of these conversations like the College Senate um, and staff council to come together to have these conversations together um, to be able to answer some of the questions that have been brought up could also be very beneficial. So I know um, that's something that I will be discussing with there later um, and maybe with you, Elf, because you are you are the um, for our faculty our connection for the faculty, maybe to have those conversations together um, and eliminate some of the, the nuances um, and the lack of clarity that we really do need to um, kind of break so we can make these decisions unilaterally. Yeah, I think that every campus will will handle this differently, right? And, and one of our goals in drafting this and pushing it out to the campuses was to increase our dialogue about it and what each campus chooses to do. I mean, uh, at our last meeting, one campus had already voted on it. So, so how you, um, how each campus chooses to address this is, is at your discretion. That is up to you folks for it to work best for you. I believe it's Mark and then John, is that right? Mark, you're up. Yes. So just a point of clarification, we should be sharing with our campuses the draft Connecticut State Senate resolution, correct? And not the FAC resolution on FY25. Uh, well, I wouldn't exclude the FAC resolution necessarily, Mark. The Senate voted on that. We acted on that at the December meeting. So your campus could choose to endorse it as well, but it is the Connecticut State Senate resolution that we are asking you to have conversations and, and vote on, hopefully to endorse. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. John. Uh, to the second half of the question, which is about governance, shared governance and how it relates across the bodies. Um, do you have a sense or maybe does anybody have a sense of what the original intent was? Was it to have each each individual campus kind of function on its own with its own autonomy in governance and then have this body be the place where those came together? Or are there questions about is that an efficient way to govern that we need to have addressed and adjusted? Because I would assume that in each campus individually prior to merger, you had an easy way to determine when which body, if you had multiple bodies on your campus, would be speaking for the campus, right? Depending on where the issue originated from or if it was a faculty issue or not. But now that we've come together, is that something that there's a desire to see change? 
or was that something that we already kind of thought about and looked at and said, no, you know, campus independence is a key part of our governance. It, I think we could have a special meeting on that. Those questions alone, John, I don't know that it was given due consideration. And even if it was, it wasn't by the campuses with. A, a, a really uh, meaningful conversation and input and every campus is different. So, so one element and, and, you know, this from executive council, as we've tried to sort through different kinds of feedback we've received from, from campuses is, um, well, which body gave us that feedback? Uh, because sometimes it's very small and sometimes it represents the entire campus and sometimes it matters. We need to know what those nuances are. So, um, I'm wondering if, if perhaps a special meeting is in order, I will leave that to the Senate to make that decision. But we are seeing these more complicated questions becoming more important. The more we try to do this, Angelo, and then Alan, can I just. Respond oh, and say, yes, I'd, be willing, yeah. I'd, be, I'd be willing to make a motion that we form a group to. Maybe ask those questions or maybe come together and kind of articulate. You know, what question we would need to ask if other people are interested. Uh, so, what exactly is your motion? Form a committee to articulate governance questions. Is that? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not making a motion. I just want okay. folks to know that I'd be willing to make that motion if there was other interest. But I'd love to hear what you know. Alan's about to say and some other folks. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Angelo, and then Alan. So for um, um, John, the um, all camp all colleges uh, had these meetings once a month where all the different categories, uh, faculty, uh, CCPs, maintenance, and all the people gather together and it's change information about what's happening on, 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 on campus. I, so that was the know, purpose Angelo, of doing that. It, the, all of the camp, all of the colleges didn't have all of those meetings. That's one of the complications. Well, <laughs> I agree with you. I mean, we do, we, we did have, still do have different uh, organizations. For instance, we don't have a Senate, but some of the guys have a Senate. So we have the, that difference, but that kind of delves in into my, my actual question, which is I'm really struggling, you know, um, in, 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 in understanding the, the merger. I mean, I hear you saying, like, you know, each campus is different. Each campus has its own individuality and all that. But at the same time, we are one college. So shouldn't policies be the same for all the different campuses? I mean, what or there should be some things are individualized, some others are not. And back to John's question. Uh, which one should they be system wide? Which ones should be uh, individualized instead? So I'm really struggling. Um, you know, where's the line uh, between the merger and the individual campuses? That's my struggle. I think you just articulated the questions that we were that that we are grappling with, Angelo. Alan, thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm part of the governance review. Uh, I'm chair of the governance review on our campus. We just finished um, uh, last last year uh, a the governance document, updating it to reflect the the upcoming merger. Um, it was uh, negotiated in in long conversation with our CEO at the time, Dr. Terry Brown. Uh, he and our current CEO. Uh, both signed off on it um, at the uh, yeah in June of last year. So to me, one of the things that I've really appreciated from Dr. Maduko is him saying that you know governance would be you know how how the various campuses uh, operate would be left at the local level. To me, that was one of the things that um, I think has helped to make. Uh, the consolidation uh, easier, you know, on uh, the fact that we can keep doing 
things the way that we've done them and and we're doing them thought we we're doing that thoughtfully so i i probably would come down on the other side of wanting to standardize uh local governance on the campuses across the state um that's that's just my own personal feelings about it because of because it is such a it's it's pretty well developed uh at at gateway and um uh i'd hate to to give that up or have someone dictate that it that it had to change thanks thank you alan nicola i echo alan's sentiment right um we can't i don't i don't think it would be wise to come up with a one size fits all all of our campuses are so varied when we look at size and number of employees. So I think that it would be disingenuous of us to tell a campus that this is how they have to run their local governance. I think it should be left to individual campuses. As long as it's a, a well functioning um, governance body, I don't think that we should have anything to do with that or af affect it. And yet, we are left with the question of which governance body counts when we are asking for endorsements. And, you know, what if, what if one of four governance bodies endorses from a campus? How do, how do we register that? And, and I think that, that, not I think, that is the question that I was putting forward is, is there a combined governance of faculty, staff, and all college governance body? And what is that body for each campus? So that we register that as the cohesive uh, piece. John. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I understand where Alan and Nick come from and I agree with you. I don't think the question is a question of effectiveness for governance, though, because I, I'm sure that the, each campus has an effective governance. The question is integration. How do we interact with it? Uh, Alan, at our at our election uh, committee meeting, we had a conversation about this, right? How would votes take place when some campuses, everyone votes, and in other campuses, only people that are a member of the faculty vote for a faculty and only the people that are professional staff, right? And so those little differences make it difficult then for us to integrate the work that we're doing in the body, which with each of the 12 campuses individually. So not that it's wrong, and I, you know, it's kind of like, you know, state level versus federal level. You know, <laughs> we're dealing with that right now in America, right? So like, we're, I, we understand trying to negotiate that, but I think the question needs to be asked, or at least we need to put some work into figuring out how we do it. Like, what is the mechanism by which we allow or communicate with individual bodies versus all the bodies? I mean, does one campus have to have agreement between three different bodies before, you know, CT State Senate would, you know, take a resolution from them? Or can one body of a campus on Gateway say, hey, we want to put this resolution, another body on Gateway say, hey, we're opposed to this resolution, and then, you know, what would the State Senate do? Those are some things that I think we need to work out, or at least understand. Right. And how would we register? How would we know if 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 only one of those two bodies brings something to Senate? How do we know that someone another governance body at the same campus opposed it? And I think you're starting to discern um, some of those problems. Sandra, hi. So the way I see this moving forward is we're all starting at a low level right now. We're we're kind of in the beginning stages of this. So currently at Tunxis, we have a PSO, Professional Staff Organization. And that is a body that includes the faculty and the staff. And we bring an agenda from the college and then we make everybody can vote. So I think instead of trying to make it so large an umbrella at each campus, you know, maybe if we start something small and then tweak it, start from that level then everybody can vote at each campus and then we can figure out our way and navigate as we become more mature. Something at a lower level, not so high to bring to Senate. Thank you, Sandra. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand lower level. I do understand 
what you're talking about of refining, of trying these smaller things, I totally understand that. Um, but is that the gist of what you mean, though? It is. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. Alan and then Mike Stefanowitz. Thanks. Um, but it doesn't it, any senator has the right to put forward an agenda item, correct? Yes. So, so if I had an agenda item, say that was endorsed by my faculty, um, but but uh, staff were not involved, whether they agreed or not, um, I could bring that forward if it seemed if and if the executive team felt that it was a worthwhile topic, it could be up for discussion and. You could certainly ask, well, who endorsed this? Was it endorsed by your primary governance um, body? Do you have a primary governance body? Um, and then, I, well, it was endorsed by faculty. Um, you know, and you'd have that information, and perhaps that would be a, a weighing factor for some. Say, well, since it wasn't endorsed by, you know, your call your campus's primary governance body, then, you know, maybe I'm hesitant about backing it. I mean, that would be in the mix, right? But but we we all have the right to bring forward agenda items. So, I, I mean, it's, yeah, I know this is a discussion. That's, it's a definitely a worthwhile discussion to have. So. It, it, it is, and I appreciate the, the thoughtfulness that's going into it. But Alan, what you, what you just said, it still relies upon the body, the, this body, this, the Connecticut State Community College Senate, knowing what the bodies are at a given campus in order to ask the right question. Yeah, and so, but I mean that we may just need to be willing to, to talk about that as, um, you know, as a matter of course amongst, amongst ourselves. Um, maybe not make it a requirement, but it's certainly a question that we can ask one another. Yeah, thank you. Mike. Mike, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Ah, sorry. There was uh, just quickly, there was a group that grappled with many of these same issues during the uh, governance proposal stage or the shared governance work group. And uh, Nicola may recognize some of this language. He was, she served on that and I thank you for that time, Nicola. Um, and in the, the document that was uh, put forward back in 22 um, made some recommendations. And the recommendation was that there should be a primary body um, on a campus. We recommended that it be called the Campus Senate. I will say the sentiment among those work group members was it was really important that that body have representation for faculty, staff, and students. So that was really the, the focus. Um, I put in the chat some of the language around that. The group did not want to dictate to a campus that they have to create a campus senate. Um, that if a, there was a PSO, for instance, at Tunxis, and that had faculty, staff, and students, that could be the body. Um, so I think there's guidelines around local governance, um, but it would be up to each campus. But if there is a primary body that includes those three rep bodies represented, and they want to identify themselves as the primary governance body locally to then make recommendations to this group, that was what was envisioned in that original proposal, and maybe that's something that could be built upon. Um, just wanted to share that. Thank you. Mike, because nothing in the chat is saved, but it, uh, it, it doesn't become part of the minutes. Can you send that to me, to the CO College Senate, so I can share that document with sure. senators? I can Thank send you. it to everybody in the meeting invite if, if they're all on the invite. Yeah, I'll send it out to everybody if that would help out. Yep. That, would, that would be great. Thank you. Um, Sandra. Hi, I agree with Mike. As long as there's faculty, staff, and students allowed, it doesn't matter what you call it. And then we could bring it to this committee. I, I agree with Mike. Right. Uh, Roberta. So I'm putting my former student activities director hat on, if I may, and we call upon our students a lot for a lot of things. And our student leaders are some of the most um, at risk because they are spread so far. So <clears throat> I would just be asked that we're mindful about how much we require of student 
participants on any governing body because they also have their own governing body. You know, so we just want to be mindful of how much we're putting on top of them and we're asking of them over and over and over again. Thank you. So that is an important reminder. Thank you, Roberta. Any further comments? Before we move on to items of new business. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a really good conversation. I think I think what comes from this is is that that we are still grappling and we are growing and um, we will probably always be do be doing a little bit of both of those things. But we can also refine what we are doing and be a little bit more effective and efficient. So, thank you for your thoughtful participation. Uh, moving on to new business, Sandra, the floor is yours for the academic affairs committee. So, basically, this goes back to our PSO committee that we have at Tunksys, uh, faculty, staff, students, and I guess. I'm not faculty, but in the past, before we became one college, there was an academic affairs committee on each campus. And Mark and Kirsten, if I'm not saying this correctly, please help me. And these academic affairs committees would meet from each academic area, and they would bring forth suggestions of maybe um, tweaking a course in a program or adding a new program, things like that. And then that information would be sent up the chain to where I'm not sure if Kirsten and Mark, you can tell me, we would like, or the PSO at our campus would like to re-engage this academic affairs committee and bring these ideas so that they are sent up the chain to higher buffs to discuss and review them and say, oh, this might work or, you know, somehow get the idea from the campus up to the top. Is that correct, Mark and Kirsten, or do you have anything to add? I have nothing to add. Well spoken. Okay. Um I, I have I have a, a question, Sandra, and and that is how how would this committee or this I guess it's committee you're suggesting um because we have the SDCs and the SACCs and we have discipline groups, it's not clear to me how the escalation or the elevation would occur. Um, the, the local conversations, especially because the only things you've given me are courses, so that's the only way that I can frame this right now, right? Um, but those conversations happen in different places now. so. It doesn't make sense to me for that for that aspect. Okay, so here's where I'm going to call on my uh, colleagues at Tunksis, Kirsten and Mark. You know more about how this was handled in the past and if maybe you can. I say courses, I know there's other things that were taking place, but I don't know all of them. So I don't know if either one can help me with this. Can either of you speak to this? Um, hi, it's Kirsten. So, uh, I, I have to just put it out there that I am relatively a new full time faculty member. Um, prior to this position, I worked as a lab manager uh, full time. So I was uh, staff. And um, I do remember academic affairs and it was mostly a curricular body that looked at um, curriculum, any changes, any updates, any uh, program um, modifications. So courses may have um, become not necessary. Uh, so it was kind of, you know, updating the curriculum for either uh, adding courses or um, getting, you know, refining the, the programs. Um, and so they would meet regularly and then they would vet that whole curricular process and bring those um, course designations in a list to our campus governance body, which is our PSO. Um, and then each line item would be gone through 
just for the PSO to vote. And also if there was any discussion that needed to occur at that point, because uh, staff and students, you know, anybody who was not um, part of the academic affairs committee uh, really didn't have any um, maybe insight or contribution to what was decided on the academic affairs. Uh, so the PSO was the opportunity to gather any other information, ask questions, get clarity, et cetera. Um, so since we became one college, that that committee has disbanded because now we have another curriculum Congress and we have the discipline, if I'm saying it right, the SDC um, that, you know, faculty are members of. But I think that the reason um, our faculty want to look at the academic affairs in reinstating that committee, and I'm, I'm not exactly certain that I have everything correct, but I think it's just because um, there's such a lag in the process between the other committees in getting decisions, and it seems that um, there's just some gaps and things are falling through the cracks, and they just want to try to capture um, as much of the curriculum information and ha keep it moving forward as effectively as possible. Um, I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see, I see president Maduco's hand, but before I go there, I, I, I think that. I think it could cause because we have curriculum Congress and the SDCs. I'm worried about starting campus level committees that, that don't help advance or actually solve the problems that are being identified. And I, I think that governance review, nobody's saying the A word of assessment, but that's really what we're starting to talk about. I think that that is, might be, that could fill that gap. Um, President Maduco. Yeah, you know, for starters, um, so, so thank you to our colleagues from Kung Fu um, um, for your insight. I think that's helpful because I think we have to, um, you know, if Kung Fu is feeling this way, then maybe other campuses are feeling this way when it comes to there's this lag. Now, to be fair to, to Curriculum Congress, you know, we have 300 plus active credit based degrees and certificates right so it, it it is a it is mount everest in terms of the level of work however you know what has been the the process to get feedback that's been shared to curricular congress to say wait a minute like an individual campus feels like either our recommendations our concerns or suggestions are not going anywhere right um or it's taken too long Right, so so I think that's be so I think you know you know not speaking for Senate, but I think that's where Senate could, you know, Senate executive leaders could you know engage the leaders of Congress to say, hey, this is what this is the feedback we're getting, right? I think that's one. I think two, and I think, oh, I I, I can I can sense your concerns is, ultimately, like we're one college, so though, supporting a local campus to make suggestions recommendations of. We need to tweak this course because we're seeing some issues. It still has to go across the various levels of Congress and ultimately ultimately be ratified at the curriculum Congress state level, right? Because we can't make a, you know, it's different if it's a standalone niche program that only one campus has, you know, but you know, you can't make a change to English at one local location. That change would have to be applied across the institution. So I think just how do we support obviously the the recommendations the concerns um from you know from a from a local campus but also ensure that at the end of the day you know congress is the main body um, that ratifies our curriculum right but I, I wonder is congress hearing this right is it getting back to congress in terms of you know we're having these concerns locally is there something that can be done or are they working on it so that that's just again. I don't want to duplicate. I don't, don't want to have duplicated processes and add to the timeline and make things even longer for things to be reviewed. So that's just my my you know my concern when I'm hearing. But you know I I empathize with the campuses if you're feeling hey like it's not going anywhere and we want to you know re, you know you know um, 
restart a group that we felt was working pre pre merger. So I, I want to, to make clear to everyone on the call that the next item on our agenda, and I see hands and I will call on you, but the next item on the agenda is the governance review discussion uh, because Curriculum Congress does have, as you know, I sent you the email, Curriculum Congress is talking about doing a review. Um, and, and I think we are starting to see those intersections of, of how that review might be taking place. So, um, Miguel, and then John. So just just quickly, um, as somebody who, who serves on Congress, um, we have heard um, uh, some, some frustration in terms of the dissemination of what we are doing, what's approved in the process and all that. Um, and it is something that we are actively trying to work on to get the information to uh, the individual campuses in a more timely manner both before votes and actions are taken and also after votes and actions are taken. Um, one thing that, that, in fact, this just came up today and, and Mike uh, brought this up in our meeting this morning, um, because we met this morning, is that the curriculum process does not just involve uh, the SDCs, the SACs, and the Congress. Anything that is passed also has to go up to the provost's office and potentially to the BOR as well. So one of the things that we want to make sure is clear is that when we report out on our actions, uh, it, it's it's understood that that is still subject to further review by higher by higher authorities. So I just wanted to say that we are looking at how do we inform people ahead of time in terms of the agenda, in terms of the items and all of that, and B, how do we inform people about what we're doing and what's been acted on. I don't know if that helps anything, but I just thought I would throw it out there. <laughs> Thank you. I, I do think that that contributed to the conversation, Miguel. Uh, John and then Mike. John, you're you're on mute. I swear I clicked the button. Thanks, Miguel. Um, I, I appreciate what you added to the discussion. It's helpful to understand what I was going to ask in regards to this motion is um, if we think that some of the delay that's coming from curriculum in Congress is more due to the startup nature, right? They're still getting it, the system's working and rolling, and maybe some support or help from a body uh, on a local campus might not be a permanent solution, but maybe a temporary solution. And I wonder if you guys have maybe considered that as a way to maybe help in the short term. It seems like when we develop a body for the campus, like that will just last for the next 50 years and it might not be necessary. There just might be, uh, it might be necessary to help deal with a backlog just because, you know, curriculum Congress is getting started and they've only been running for a little while. But to what Miguel was saying, if, if there is more steps and it's going to be a longer term process, then that might be something that gets identified in our next uh, point. Like Elsa, we're about to talk about. As far as systems go, um, and it might not solve the campus issue. Al, if I could just just touch on one quick point um, that, that John mentioned in terms of, so there is a provision now for campus feedback, um, as as you as you you know may or may not know. Um, part of the the feedback, part of the cycle, the curriculum cycle, uh, at the initial stage for the school discipline councils. Uh, involves uh, sending them back for whatever review the campus wants to do, be it the governance body or even the local curriculum committee. So, for example, here at Gateway, we still we kept our curriculum committee, um, and we also have campus governance bodies. Uh, so both of those potentially could weigh in on curricular issues and give feedback, send feedback back to the SDC. Um, I think that 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 we're we're starting to get our our, our feet going now. We're but we're catching up, I think, pretty nicely in terms of uh, the backlog. And, I, and today we actually did not go over. I think it's the first meeting that we adjourned at two and a half hours in a long time. So, uh, so that was good. Um, you know, so there already is that process for uh, for feedback at the local level. I'm not sure. So I, I'm not I'm not sure what sort of additional feedback um, you're looking to to get. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to continue listening and, and obviously I'm just 1 person, I'm, you know, 
Merdad and Hannah are both also on uh, Truth in Congress as well, so they can they can weigh in certainly as well. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, Mike and then Mark. Thank you. Uh, I see the clock is we're over time, so I'll try and be very quick. Just I don't know if this relates to the concerns from Tungsis, but a number of people have raised the issue that there is no formal academic standards committee as part of our governance model. And I think while our curriculum process does encourage local feedback and there's a process and all of that, it's a little bit of a gray area for things that are not specifically curriculum related, but are academic related. And there's concern about whether that should go to this body or to the Congress. The Congress has been very, very busy, but it's something that if we do do a governance review, I, I would welcome people's suggestions and I would li love to hear should there be a, you know, a possible joint committee with from these two bodies or a subcommittee of one or the other related to academic standards? Often those are different than traditional curriculum issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, because I, I raised exactly that issue at our last meeting, those gray areas that are starting material to materialize and, and gave a very, very similar example. Uh, Mark, you are our final speaker, sir. Miguel, I was encouraged to hear that your campus has a curriculum committee, and I think that that's what we were longing to restore at Tunxis with our academic affairs committee. It's just, it was at that time a body that comprised representatives from every academic department, and it was a place where faculty who wanted to develop a new course or was contemplating course changes could go and then uh, debate, discuss with the committee about those curriculum issues before bringing it to the main governance body of the college, which is our professional staff organization or campus senate. And right now we would Probably that would comprise all the STCs and SAC members. They would be on the committee. And it would be just more of a formal thing rather than maybe the STCs and the SACs feeling like they're flailing in the wind, uh, kind of lonely trying to put forth all these uh, curriculum issues. And I'm just wondering if other campuses feel like they have uh, local bodies where these things can be discussed before they are brought up to the next level. Well, I am curious, Mark, about the proliferation of committees and how many people do we have? How will we, how will well folks participate in all of those different levels? Um, if, if we start to have the proliferation of committees, even if they are useful, I, I think you brought the issue to our attention about not being able to find people to participate in meaningful ways, right? I, I do agree with that comment, but it would be the, the already elected representatives, the SDCs who would comprise the committee. I, I think what we're just talking about is giving each local campus a body where curriculum can be discussed before it moves up the chain if they so choose right uh yeah which i think they'd probably be glad to have comrades in arms <laughs> discussing these issues with them thank you all right i see that murdad has raised his hand and so has nicola uh so nicola and then murdad i was just going to say that uh Three Rivers, it's the local curriculum body that we have. It's not called that, but it's the Academic Standards Review Committee or something along those lines. And our local governance, um, it tends to be the newer faculty members and staff members that are cutting their teeth, so to speak, on how campuses are able to um, meet and, and get their agendas and get things accomplished. So that's that tends to be what is happening at our campus anyway. Thank you, Nick. Murdan? I'm, I'm just worried about committee overload. 
and uh, overkill basically and uh, as well as uh, you know giving making sure stcs actually work well uh, at our campus we have given up com uh, curriculum committee because there have been so many repeats of repeats even the divisions have been uh, dissolved to some degree because of repeating of reporting and everything else uh, we do have an academic senate which includes staff uh, but again curriculum is dealt with between departments and affected departments so instead of really making it a general campus-wide um, issue thanks thank you sir all right well i i hope that this was useful and that campuses will feel empowered to act in ways that will best serve each campus. Uh, moving on to our next item for agenda uh, it, under new business is governance review. And I want to preface this conversation by saying that uh, the chair of curriculum Congress, Jason Seabury and I have not connected. He did send an email at the end of last semester the gist of which I have shared with senators already, that there is seems to be an interest in curriculum Congress in doing a review. I will note that they did not say assessment, but I think that that is what we are starting to talk about is an assessment of governance. And so are any either Miguel or Merdad, did you talk today about the governance review at all? We, we didn't get to it. Um, we had, uh, we, we got through all our proposals, but then we had a significant and lengthy discussion about course modalities. Um, and that took up the entire non curricular. Part of our meeting, uh, it is on the agenda, but we didn't get to it today. Okay. So. So we, in our previous conversation uh, about the academic affairs committee, we started to hear about things that are and are not working in governance, both at the campus level. I think our discussion about um, how information is or is not uh, being acknowledged or, or processed or validated or included. These, these are all elements of, of effective governance. And so my question to Senate is, is there a desire by Senate to begin a formal review of governance so that we can make small changes to improve? And Roberta. Um, to answer your question, I would say yes. I think there are <clears throat> there's a number of spaces I've been in, both as a senator as well as just as a, an employee, where I'm hearing of faculty, especially talking about the process of getting curriculum moved up the chain and where it's getting stuck and the um, uh, perceptions of unfair representation on different committees. And I just think that taking a look at the overhaul, we've been in this situation for you know, we've been in this this new governance model for a year now, and let's take a look at what is working well so that we can further stand it up and then take a look at what's not working well so that we can provide it more support and perhaps, you know, just more eyes looking at the process. So I would very much be in favor of starting some kind of a governance review or a governance, a governance assessment. And I would like to put that forward as a motion. Uh, Roberta, since since that was kind of uh long probably good long yeah can i can i can i do this i would like to make a motion to launch a governance assessment committee and invite curriculum congress to participate full stop that is my motion is there a second i will second that yep thank you alan Thank you. Um, I just wondered, do, does Senate have the authority, ability to weigh in on or to make changes to governance period, shared governance model, and specifically 
to the curriculum model? Would changes to the curriculum model need to come from the curriculum Congress or would Senate be able to make changes or propose changes? It's my, uh, so I'm gonna, my question to start the discussion, I guess. Yeah, I'm gonna hand part of that question off to Mike Stefanowitz, but I also wanna say that my motion was a collaboration, right? It, it is to work with Curriculum Congress, so it's not dictative, dictative at this point. <laughs> so it, it would be collaborative, it would be collaborative, okay. Right, right. Um, and I don't know that there is the authority to explicitly make changes, but there certainly is the opportunity to share recommendations for areas where we see improvements could be made. Um, how would you add or modify that, Mike? Uh, I would agree, Al. You know, I, I think of this in terms of there's two different levels. One are changes within a certain body, whether it's Senate or Curriculum Congress. And I put in the chat, you know, certainly bylaws could change or standard operating procedures. There's things that internally could change. I'll just remind everybody that the shared governance model broadly is a structure to provide recommendations to the president, to President Maduka. Um, that, and, and there are a number of the document that you'll receive once it gets sent out later, there were a number of guiding principles in that shared governance model that it was originally approved. Think changes were made to that model along the way. So if, for instance, there's a proposal that there should be a third governance body, and there is one currently, there's a proposal that there should be a gen ed committee, which is not a subcommittee of curriculum Congress or of Senate. It is a third body in our overall model. Unfortunately, there is no language as to how to change our model. Um, there is no specific changes about how to change the overall model. However, there was language in that model that it should be reviewed after a certain amount of time. I, I would imagine in past practice, that the governance bodies in the model all have to agree. So, so whatever is proposed, if there's, you know, if there's a proposal that there would be four main bodies, curriculum Congress, college Senate, academic standards, and gen ed, if those are four bodies now, then everybody get, has to weigh in. And the two bodies that are currently in place right now, they would have to agree would be, I believe, curriculum Congress and Senate. That's my opinion, but again, there's no language on that currently. But I love the idea of a governance review. Thank you, Al, for your proposal. I would support that. I would support a shared review, um, uh, you know, shared collaboration with Congress and and Senate. Uh, hope that helps. Yep. Thank you. Seeing no further hands, I will ask for a vote on the motion, which is to launch a governance assessment committee that will invite participation with Curriculum Congress. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those in favor, please raise your hand. John, let me know when you have a number. Thirty-three. I believe that's unanimous. Go ahead and lower your hands. Go ahead and lower your hands. Any opposed? Any opposed? No opposition, any abstentions? Sorry, Al, I don't think you can say unanimous because I think uh, I saw at least one senator that didn't raise hands at all. There are two hands that are up for abstention, so it, it is not unanimous. Thank you. Uh, that, that was an observation. I thought 33 is, is what our count was today, but folks have come in since since then. We have two abstentions. Okay. The motion carries. Um, my next question is, and I will ask for this in email also, please raise your hand if you are interested in serving on a governance review committee. Please raise your hand if you are interested in serving on a governance review committee. Brian, please make sure you capture those hands. I'm gonna say it so that it's captured on the video and we can capture it later. 
uh, I would like to serve uh, Roberta, Sandra, Joseph, uh, John, Lisa, Nicola, Mike Stefanowitz. Thank you, Mike, and Sarah Perez. Very good. Thank you, folks. Go ahead and lower your hands. And remember that will be a, a joint committee with Curriculum Congress, so we will be working with them. I believe this marks our um, our midway point, our midway point through our meeting. So I am going to call us into a recess and we will have a five minute break. We will have a five minute break and we will come back at 216, folks, 216. Thank you.
Okay, folks, we're returning from recess. It is 2.16. The last seconds are ticking away. Mm. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Nick. The next item on our agenda is also from Tunxis, and mm -hmm. that is the process for dropping students. Sandra, the floor is yours. Sandra, are you back yet? Okay, we're going to to skip down to Senate logistics and we'll return, we'll return to Sandra's mm -hmm. item. Um, so we had three open items from our previous meeting. Let me tell you, I'm really enjoying, and I say that facetiously, going back and listening to our three and a half hour meetings uh, to make sure that we're not dropping anything. Nicola, you said something, but I couldn't hear you. My speed is your friend. Oh, yes, yes, we did discover that. Um, written reports, written reports from the committee. So I shared uh, with you the language in the charter and, and there is some language that says that uh, documents are needed, but I am asking Senate to ask for written reports or before our meetings so that verbal reports are quicker and uh, sometimes we can skip over those verbal reports when it is not warranted. So uh, I am making a motion that committee chairs submit a written report to the SharePoint or appropriate folder to expedite our committee times. Is there a second to that motion? It's Nicola, I second. Thank you. Ariel, were you going to second? <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was too slow. Nope, that's okay. I just wanted to make, make sure. Thank you. Alan. Thanks. Yes, I just wanted to verify that um, ultimately those committee chairs are receiving some additional compensation. Additional time with, in, in <laughs> what point that takes. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. And the, Alan, the charter already requires written notes to be shared, so this isn't a significant additional ask. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we hold a vote? All those in favor, please raise your hands. All those in favor, please raise your hand. John, let me know when you have a count. Still going. <laughs> 30, uh, 32. 32, thank you. Go ahead and lower your hands, folks. Those opposed, anyone opposed? No opposed, any abstentions? Any abstentions? The motion passes without opposition or abstention. Thank you folks. The next item is the tracking tool. So, um, by a show of hands, how many of you have been able to, or have, how many of you have gone to the SharePoint and looked at the tracking tool that we developed? By a show of hands, how many folks have actually looked at that tracking tool? It, the tracking tool responded explicitly to the ask from our November meeting. So the question, you know, I, I, I'm making this, I'm formalizing these asks uh, because someone has to do that work. It, 
And it, it turns out it's a lot of work to really identify and, and track these issues. We give you, Executive Council gives you information in the monthly emails that we send, but I think it's hard to, perhaps to digest or to, to anchor the information to the individual items. So the question is, do we continue to use that tracking tool, Alan? To be honest, you know, I saw the I saw the ask, and I'm I didn't know what to even look for. You know, I went to the SharePoint, I saw all the files. I didn't know what the tracking. I still don't know what it is. I don't know what it is or where to find it. Just to be honest. Okay. Well, hold on just a second. Same. Um, I don't know where to find it either, and I'm looking in the SharePoint drive right now. So if you go to the SharePoint drive, and you click on. Hold on, I'm going to send it. I am wondering where the tracking tool is myself. Can anyone on the executive council? Where did we put that? No wonder you can't find it. All right. Uh, oh, and I just got kicked out. <laughs> I can't bring it up for you if I wanted to. Uh, what I will do is share that again. I, I'll share a direct link to that and, and we will address this at our next meeting. How about that? I have just gotten kicked out of all my applications except WebEx. So <laughs> um, the last item is communications. CT State is working on ways for us to share information with the college community. But again, this has to go to someone. So is there a motion? to take part in these uh, communications, whether that's an email or an announcement that focuses on Senate. And if so, in that motion, is it the executive council or the president who is writing that, who is doing that work? Again, this is going to matter for release and workload for whoever. This is not just about me, but this is about whoever is doing this work. Nicola. So are you, proposing something in addition to the Connecticut State Senate website that if someone goes to clicks on the link gets is able to get to all of the minutes and the videos. I am. I am. I'm, I am suggesting um, we have been offered the opportunity to participate using email and or the Connecticut State announcements that perhaps summarizes the things that we worked on or will be working on. So, you know, um, extemporaneously, Nicola, I'm thinking about some of the things that we are going to work on. Uh, we're doing governance review. What are some of the other things that were important that uh, we were soliciting more participation in course caps, right? So we could share that and along with who is chairing a committee or a point of contact to increase communication. Sarah. Sorry, I wanted to tell you, I'm like, I know I saw this. It's in, it's under the December folder and it's Senate issues and it's an Excel file. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I, I will send out a direct link for everyone just so everybody can, can find it quickly and easily. Is there a desire to participate in that communications? I think that, that communicating what we are doing, you know, a lot of people are participating in President Maduka's office hours, right? We, yeah, I see people shaking their heads. Nobody knows that's as a result of the work that Senate did. So I think in, in some respects, it is letting folks know the work that we are doing. I think that the governance review, I think folks will want to know, hey, that's coming up. Perhaps we solicit questions. Doesn't mean we use them all, but having more people know the work that we're doing is important and sharing that information with the college community is important. Alan. So are you looking for a motion to um, basically authorize uh, that that kind of communication or are you just looking to form a committee? I, 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 am, I am looking for a motion to to authorize it. I don't want to just undertake this work without it Senate endorsement, Alan. 
All right, so I would like to, uh, I would like to move that uh, Senate begin a um, monthly communication to the college community um, via uh, email summarizing our uh, our work each month. Alan, could we use the CT state announcement if that were more if that fit our format better? Yeah, that comes by email, right? It it comes it's sent via email, but it would be yeah, it's separate I mean. from email, but it is an electronic form of communication. All right. So, uh either of those are permissible? Yes. Thank so you. So, we change change from email to electronic communication. Thank you. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second, I'll second, but I think that we want to also empower Elle to be the point person on that in her role as chair or president, whatever. Are you amenable to that, Alan? Is that a friendly amendment? Sure, I'll accept it as such. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, all those in favor, please raise your hands now. All those in favor. We're at 29. 29 is holding. Yep. Okay. We have 29 in favor. Go ahead and rate, lower your hands, folks. Go ahead and lower your hands. All those opposed, all those opposed. No opposition, any abstentions? Any abstentions? The motion passes without abstention or objection. Thank you, folks. I appreciate that. And I will follow up uh, and send a link to the tracking tool to you. Okay, moving on to updates from Senate committees. Brian, as chair of the administration staffing and HR committee, do you have a report? We do not. Our monthly meeting corresponded with several faculty and committee members on break. Um, so we did not meet because our monthly schedule was during that time. Very good. Thank you, you very much. Sir. February. Okay. Bookstore. Oh, I'm sorry. Sandra. I just had a question. Did I miss that we my uh, discussion of the drop list or are we going to have it at a later time? No, Sandra, we can return to that once we're done with committee reports. Sure. I I think you weren't here right at the very beginning when we came back from recess, so I skipped over it. I appreciate you bringing it to my attention because I forgot to go back and ask sure. if you were here. Thank you. So, um, if, if I start to adjourn us without going back to you, please bring it to my attention. Uh, Stephen. Hi, sorry, just some quick clarification on the, the tracker. Um, is that a document that I am permitted to share out with other people when I do the report, or is that something that should just be kept to senators as we look at it? it it's an internal Senate document. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Patrick. Um, so, respectfully, I would just like to, to jump on behind uh, Sandra as well. I'm very interested in that discussion topic on the, the drop for non payment. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna add it back once we get through Senate. Yeah, so I do just uh, respectfully understand. Also, at the end of our meetings, we start to lose people and they drop off, and and voting gets a little rough. So I just worry about uh, you know missing out on a, a topic like that. But I respect your decision. Thank you, sir. I I am hopeful, Patrick, that because it is only two thirty and we are working our way through committee reports. That that our folks will stay on uh, for our last agenda item. Um, nudge nudge. <laughs> Bookstore. 
bookstore committee. Uh, let's see, Paul, I believe you are chairing. Is that right? Paul, uh, Paul go, go, go ahead, Paul. I am, and I hope I do it justice because this is the first time I've actually chaired anything. So here we go. Uh, we had our first meeting this week. Um, some great agenda items. We talked about the availability of the book of availability of books on each campus and getting those books into the hands of students on different campuses. And we're kind of workshopping right now, maybe a courier system, um, maybe some type of um, inner office mail that we can get a book from, say, Tunxes to Naugatuck um, if we need to. Um, we also discussed veteran students um, and some of the issues that they've been having, unable to get the book, um, their book on the first day of school. Um, and developing stronger relationships with our uh, our vendor Follett, um, and making sure that they are aware of these issues as well. Um, other issues that we're going to be discussing down the road. Remember, this was our first meeting. Uh, vendor relations with Follett, um, discussing current relationships, um, evaluating the effectiveness of communication, communication and collaboration with our vendor. Um, textbook selection and pricing, reviewing the process of selecting textbooks. And the materials and discussing strategies to ensure more affordable options for our students, as well as exploring opportunities for costs, cost saving measures, um, such as rental programs or digital alternatives. And uh, that's sort of it for now, unless I'm missing something. My co chair might have some more input as well. Would that be Miguel? If, if I could piggyback on that a little bit. Um... Uh, it's worth mentioning uh, two, two other items. One is that Carrie Kelly um, and her folks uh, up at New Britain are, uh, have a work group on the bookstore as well, and we are collaborating with them um, because there are some sort of broader, bigger issues that may involve contracts, that may involve uh, labor relations, et cetera. So um, Carrie and her folks are, are working with us, and we are very happy to have that partnership. Uh, I would also just say um, that I wanted to mention, as you as you all saw the emails, we did have an incident uh, this past week involving the online bookstore where there essentially there was some fraud going on. Um, Carrie was able to report to us sort of the exact timeline and I won't go into all the details. If, if you need them, you can reach out to me or you can reach out to Kelly or any, any member of the bookstore committee. Uh, but basically, the situation was resolved within five days to the satisfaction of the uh, data security folks where student privacy and uh, fin you know, financial information privacy could be safeguarded and that portal was reopened. It, of course, happened at the most, the worst possible time, which was the first day of classes, uh, but uh, CT State did try to deal with it as quickly as possible. And as I said, it was uh, dealt with, uh, including over a weekend. Uh, within five days, it was opened up uh, the morning of the fifth day. So uh, I did want to mention just those two additional pieces um, and thank Paul for graciously stepping up to chair. So uh, I don't have to. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you, folks. And thank you, Paul, for being willing to to serve. Uh, next on our list is budget and finance. Mark. We met on Tuesday, nothing critical to report. We did have an interesting discussion on how CT State is funded. Uh, CFO Gary Kelly was in attendance, and we're always grateful for that. Connecticut's an outlier in that in the U.S. in that we don't have an established funding formula, so it's always a matter of negotiation each budget cycle and. It would be nice if there were some sort of funding formula. Some states tie it to enrollments that, you know, is potentially problematic as well, but at least there can be some guaranteed income. So we are in a precarious position and um, the, the read I'm getting is that things aren't looking particularly optimistic in terms of obtaining additional funding, but there is always hope and, of course, we'll strongly advocate for it. But um, that was it. We just had a good discussion and thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving on to the bylaws committee, Sarah. 
Okay, so I'm also a very new uh, committee chair, but um, so hopefully Roberta and my other colleagues would help jump in. Um, we've spent, we met twice during break. We met uh, at the beginning of January and we met last Friday. And really our focus has been around reviewing um, the, the voting, um, voting and elections and looking at clarifying how we're staggering the terms. And that's something we worked closely with our committee members and then also worked with Nicola. And I know that she's gonna talk a little bit about elections committee. Um, I don't know if this is the right time. Do we wanna share all the wording? I don't know if this would be the right time or if we wanna, or we're not ready yet. I think we're still drafting the so information. When, when you have a draft, I, I think ideally, and, and this is true for all of the committees, when you have a recommendation or there is some action you're taking, uh, asking Senate to take, um, share that ahead of time. Everyone has access to our email list. So share that ahead of time. Point to specific things that you're you're wanting folks to, to look at um, so that they have time for that really thoughtful review. And then if we have the opportunity, if there is uh, agreement, then we can make those motions during Senate. Certainly we can do that quick review, put it up on the screen. But otherwise, we really do need those things shared ahead of time. Okay. And I don't think we're ready just yet. I think we're still in the process of talks and I'm curious to see uh, what the elections committee also talked about because we, we shared some information with them. So right. that's it for us for this time. Um, Sarah, we're, am I recalling that you were gonna ask a question about using Teams? Yeah, but you responded not, to that, that and I'm not sure, I'm, I don't know yet. So I'm gonna okay. hold that back a little bit. Thank you. Okay, uh, happy to discuss that further. All right, moving on to the elections committee, Nicola. Um, I have posted, where is it at? If you go to the Connecticut State SharePoint, if you look at the purple folder, um, there is a an election folder that was placed in there. I placed it in there, I don't know when, a couple days ago. It has two folders, one with a summary of our last meeting and a, another one, another folder that has a sheet that has our next meeting dates and links to those dates. So if anyone would like to come and watch, participate, please do. Um, the next meetings are February 9th and February 23rd from 11.30 to 3, 12.30, excuse me. <laughs> Um, we met at our last meeting, we basically came up with some draft language. We are still refining. We focused on how to go about carrying out the elections for part time representatives on Senate. We are still currently working on that. One thing that we did, I think, pretty much come to an agreement on is that the elections committee will not be running campus elections. The elections committee is there to simply facilitate campus based elections and then to basically collect, store, and communicate those campus based um, election results. Um, I think one of the important pieces of language that we are trying, I'm, I think we are also trying to ensure is in that final draft is that the election results are communicated to the elections committee by local governance leaders. I think that is important that it is coming um, through one stream for all elections. Um, I think we also have draft language, basically including students in that, like I said, the, the campus-based elections are handled there. That information is then sent to the elections committee. We are working on, um, again, in that draft language, dates as to when these nominations for these part-timers are going to have to have that information from the campuses to the elections committee. Um, problem is, is that the dates that we have or I have proposed, I don't know if we're actually gonna be able to meet them for this year. So that's a, a concern that I have. Um, Alan or anyone else, Peter, or anyone else in my forgetting anything. Well, do we do we want to just float the proposal that both bylaws and elections seems to have agreed on or 
Ellen, it, it, uh, sim similar to the to the bylaws committee, I, I'm asking folks to send something out prior to our meetings before before we take action. Okay. No, I I, I said float, not vote. Yep. Um, <laughs> but okay, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Thank you, folks. Uh, the Council of Faculty to the Provost has not met since our last meeting. We have um, solicited feedback from the campuses on the syllabus template and and the final exam schedule. But other than that, we, we haven't met again since December. Uh, however, the Student Services and Professional Staff Council has met. Uh, John? Yeah, we had a, I, I thought a pretty good meeting. Um, we brought in a couple of different people that focus on two topics, uh, transfer credit issues and CPAS alerts. Um, I won't get into like super big details other than to say that we recognized some of the challenges, what the sources of some of those challenges were and have uh, recognized some of the remediation that's already underway to help take care of some of them. So I walked away feeling like um, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, CPAS alerts are going down in scope um, and processes. We had a follow-up meeting with folks to kind of dive into the weeds on how to fix even more of the issues, which have kind of related to technical issues as well as adoption issues, training issues, um, but all the, I think, moving in the right direction. Um, and there's, you know, teams of folks that are looking at uh, the transfer credit uh, reviews, uh, including uh, Mike and Jeanette's team and they're early stage, but they're underway and they're going to get done. So it was a good meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. And with that, we will return to the item of new business process for dropping students. Sandra, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to give you a little overview of what, what happens every semester. Um, prior to the first day of class beginning. So we get a drop list from system office. I don't know who generates it. I don't know how they generate it. We used to do it locally on the campuses, but now the lists that we get are not filtered correctly. We received a drop list at Tunxis on Friday afternoon of over 450 students that were to be dropped. Some of those students were already on a payment plan. Some already had aid. Um, this is a big issue. It's been ongoing since I started in the state over 30 years ago in higher ed. I thought we would be in a better position, but I understand we just need to tweak it. Um, in the beginning of the semester, enrollment management, financial aid, we have to take over these calls. So between Monday and Tuesday, just at my school, I, I know it's happening everywhere. I had to round up people and they were more than professional. They jumped on the bandwagon. We completed those calls in over less than 48 hours. Um, it was quite a task. We're trying to help new students come in. So professionally, I would rather spend my time helping students that were not SAP last semester, or they filed aid late so I can fix their aid at the campus level. Um, I would like to basically, I'm going to just show you how I compare our business. We have two holidays, one in the fall and one in the spring. I call them Christmas. And we have such an influx at our campuses at these times, but yet the staff we can increase, and I get that. So what can we do that will alleviate these calls from us? So my suggestion, and I did this when Ojakian was in, um, I was on the banner implementation team since 2001. I understand the system doesn't have a lot of money to spend, but to me, if you send out a bill to a student for $2 and you get one full-time student enrolled, your return on investment is over 100%, and then we don't have to make 450 calls. Um, I think we need to look forward for the fall semester. How can we better do this process, tweak it? I'd be happy to jump on the bandwagon. I think that 
Um, whoever does these lists needs to come down to the campus level with the deans and say, okay, I mean, we had students drop from our dental hygiene because they owed money because they had loans coming in. They should have never been dropped from their classes. As it, for our type of business, we have to rectify this. This has to be done better. It affects all areas of the campus and it also affects our production on the campus, this is counterproductive, and we can't get new students in at such a late time because we're backpedaling all the time or we're shoveling against the tide. We need to move forward. We need to have a better look forward. How are we going to better manage these calls or getting word out to our students? I really believe the paper, uh, old fashioned postage is gonna work for us because also with award letters, that was another one of my things. Our students don't know enough yet when they come in to go on to our ctstate.edu. They don't even know if they have a bill. They don't even know if they have their financial aid completed. It's just the nature of our student. Yes, they do learn it, but coming in, it's very difficult to communicate with them to get this point across. So I just wanted to say, we need just to do it better going forward. We can't move, move our enrollment needle if we're always going backwards at the beginning of each semester. So, Sandra, I, are are you um, do you have ideas? And is our staff council the appropriate group to really start brainstorming how to make this better? I would think so, but I would like <laughs> my goal is to try to get it escalated quicker than that. I don't know how, if I make, I don't know, because this is affects every campus, every semester, every year. Um, and we can do better. Yeah, I know we can't hire people and I understand that, but we need to put processes in places in place. That's going to help us move forward. And that's one thing that will help us. Okay. I, I want to hear from Patrick, whose hand is up, and then um, I want to invite President Maduco to perhaps suggest some partners and and how we can, as you said, do better. Okay, uh, Patrick, the floor is yours. Uh, Senator, I want to thank you for bringing this topic up. When I saw you propose it as agenda item, I couldn't have jumped on faster. Um, as a fellow staff member. Um, there's actually non senators from Middlesex that have joined the call to hear on this topic because. Um, absolutely, it is something that's um, disorganized. It's not, uh, there's no structure in the four. I've only been here for two and a half years. Every semester we've done it differently. Um, the, in a few different realms, I'm going to stay on just the non payment data coming in uh, to the ground level is, is sporadic. It's all over the place. Uh, I want to draw attention to one specific example. Um, the first round of the first drop date, um, we got the information the Friday before Christmas break. Um, we returned from Christmas break with uh, limited staff as you know, we did have some staff on campus, but most were on vacation. Um, a very, you know, Paul asked to make a lot of calls similar to your campus, Sandra. We, we jumped in and did that work as well. Uh, only to have the drop postponed at the end of that process. And I believe that was a campus based decision. I'm not 100% positive. I can only speak for for our experiences here at Middlesex. Um, but often when we're calling students, they don't they don't know they're being dropped. So I would even propose as well with Sandra and, and I want to get this moving quicker too. Um, more clear, defined, published drop dates. I'm a big proponent of dropping students. I don't want to see them get trapped. I've worked with colleagues on presidential waivers this semester of students who should have been dropped but weren't, um, and then ultimately trapped in those, um, you know, with that bill. So I, I do think it's an item of importance. And, you know, we know that uh, November 15th and July 15th are packed deadline dates, right? We should have a a December 1st, a January 1st, the day before classes, there should just be a structured drop date that we can tell students as we're working with them. We're also seeing more students than ever register ahead of time, all right? You know, I think here at Middlesex, we were close to 50% of our continuing students registered before January 1st, right? So structure definitely needs to be in place. 
Um, and I think it's reasonable enough with, with defined dates, um, you know, where you can plan for that outreach. It's and, uh, not only the planning part, it's, I don't know who generates these drop lists. I don't know where it comes from. So we need to let them know this is who we don't drop. This is who you keep, you know, people with loans. It, from what I understand, if it works like um, our, our student extract and banner, it's a huge spreadsheet. It's a lot of work. I get that. But if we can lay down the criteria ahead of time, you know, work at it, each campus, this is who we have, send it up to somebody. I'll be, I'll be happy to be on that committee, but it needs to be addressed. It's got to be tackled ASAP. Yeah, and the last one point that I, I forgot to mention that I feel most strongly about is we've had a high number of students register from the first day of classes through yesterday the, or even today with late start. Um, it ended right as of the list was generated for January 19th, uh, at least to my knowledge. We haven't captured all of the students that are registering this week who are um, potentially most at risk of not securing their financial aid um, before our census date, right? So um, in, in diving into that a little bit more, these, there is no more drops from what we understand, that these students will not be dropped, potentially putting them at risk of, of um, you know, going, of owing that money. And, and that's a potential you know, the, it's a burden for them, but also a retention risk for us here at CT State. Right, I, I'm done. <laughs> okay, Th thank you both. Um, where are we, uh, Peter? Yeah, th this is this is also a, a, an issue I feel strongly with. I've been on part of the calling team, if you will, the last two semesters. And and again, if I just step back from a strategic standpoint, we all work for admissions, right? We we clearly understand the importance of trying to get people into our classrooms or online or whatever so we can de deliver wonderful you know learnings for them um and it it, it was first of all they're tough calls to make for everybody right it, it, it kind of your collections basically the collections calls so so that could be tough right up front for some people on the team and that type of thing but above and beyond that it, it just seems as though i'm not sure exactly what the criteria are so while I certainly, you know, love the idea of knowing what your revenue and is being tough and coming up with firm guidelines and that type of thing, I just think every effort should be made to work with these students. So in other words, if somebody's on their fourth semester and they've paid for all three and suddenly something's coming up in the fourth and again, you're caught up in the same, guess what? You know, I just think there needs to be some wiggle room, right? Because people get so close to the finish and that type of thing. So again, I, I recognize it's tough. And there are resource resource constraints. It's really tough to to handhold and and maybe do things on a one on one basis. But it seems to me that maybe there could be some triage line or something that there could be some segmentation of of non payment, if you will, with different action steps accordingly. Because I just feel like we have the the potential to be driving some people away that that we really want to capture, we really want to help finish and progress. So again, don't have the answers, but I I just think, I'm not sure a one size fits all approach is right. That's that's my feedback. Peter, we don't need the answers in this meeting. Mm -hmm. we, we just need for the folks who are involved to make clear that this is warranted. And then we need folks who can and will work with the right folks at CT State to make this better. And that's that's what you folks are advocating for. Right. And as soon as we're done hearing from, from the floor, I will ask for a motion uh, to do that work, okay? okay so, thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Roberta. Roberta, you're on mute. I apologize for that. Um, I was going to say, when we're making these calls, what I have found over the last few years, not just those last semester, is that a bulk of these students are on the SAP advising hold. They're they're not SAP. They're they're awaiting a response from an appeal. They're awaiting a response for tuition issues or medical withdrawals in the previous semester. These are all students who they're not just the student typically who just oh I forgot to pay sorry whoops they have financial aid issues they all have complicated situations and we're asking faculty or staff who don't have access to any of those banner screens to make these 
collections calls and it's just, it is hard on them, but it's even harder on the students because they can't necessarily get the answers that they need or someone who can help them because then they're referred to an office where there's one or two people in an office trying to manage 500 phone calls in any given day. You've got nursing students who have also been dropped for non-payment. They have a little bit easier because we can get them back into their class easy enough, but those pre-allied health pre-nursing students that are fighting for those AP one and two classes, when they get dropped from a class, the hysterics that they feel and the, the anxiety that it causes them, it, it sets them up for failure right from the very beginning of the semester. And so I've just seen it time and time again, unfortunately, I do not know the answer. Um, but I, I, I would like us to maybe use some of the text features that our students are on their phones with every day more often. Um, we have lost that ability completely to text our students. And so that's my additional two cents. So I, I more hands are going up. So I think we actually need a motion. We need a motion before we continue to discuss this because what, what this conversation is doing is teasing apart some of the complexity but we actually need a group of people to take these complexities and solicit more input and work with CT State. So Sandra, do you have a motion? I make a motion to form a group to reevaluate the drop list process and work along with CT State, is that good? Can, does it need to be a new group, Sandra, or can it be the staff council? I guess the staff council would be fine, yeah. That's, that was the, the purpose. Now, it doesn't have to be limited to, we can say the motion could be the staff council and other interested members to evaluate the process and work with CT State. Perfect. Okay, is there a second? A second, that's Patrick. We have lots of seconds. I think that was Patrick and Lisa. And Lisa and Jennifer, too, I think. Uh, all right. And now hands have gone down. I think other people wanted to see the hear exactly what the motion was going to be. Also, thank you very much, folks. President Maduco. Yes, this is my favorite topic in higher ed. Um, I have not worked at a institution where this wasn't um i won't say a mess because because there, there's a lot of people who uh, who work hard in this process but that it's just it's you know it's a beast and a monster of a process um so so a couple of things i i fully support um the need um and the request and recommendation to um have another group look at what we're doing especially from the from the perspective of the users that's always helpful because um, the goal should should be to get it right, right? It doesn't matter who's right. We just have to get it right. Um, you know, we drop for non-payment, especially uh, when it comes to Title IV funding. There's an intersectionality when it comes to federal regulation and also like our own board policy. And 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 sometimes, many times, they conflict with each other, right? Um, there's a student piece. I like I agree when there's a a new student, a returning student, a pending graduate. And like they're right on the cusp, right? They just need a little bit more time, but the risk is we don't drop them and then they have bad debt, right? Now, like now they owe, owe a bill to Uncle Sam. Uh, it can impact their credit. It follows them, right? So there is no resetting of it. Even if they transfer, they fall, you know, it follows them. And then we as an institution, we have bad debt. And I'll allow Carrie Kelly or CFO chime in a minute. Um, so so a couple of things. I support that. Uh, I do think um you know, uh, Mike Stefano has put in the chat what Tamika Davis had said. So we do send paper bills, right? So we we recognize that paper. You get a, we all hate receiving bills. You get a paper bill, like you 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 tighten up a little bit compared to a text message or whatever. Um, and and it's continuous paper bills. Um, but you know we can be better. I do think a one page overview for the entire institution to understand just this process, all of the players involved could be helpful. Um, and I think we need a debrief. So upon ad drop, there should be a college wide debrief in terms of just the raw numbers. What happened? What worked? Who's pissed off now? Right? What do we need to fix? I, I think that could be helpful. Um, 
Um, and then last but not least, you know, can we leverage resources across campuses for those campuses that feel like we just don't have the bandwidth to make all the calls and be front, you know, front facing to students. Um, and then last but not least, I know Dr. Davis, um, who's our interim vice president of enrollment management and both Gail Barrett um, and Steve McDowell report to her. I know they're working on an operations calendar, right? They list like key dates. So everyone knows exactly when when messages are going out or, or when bills are being sent out and et cetera. And it's a living document. So we feel like there's issues with that. We can update it and change it. So I just kind of want to share that um, with all of you. And then last but not least, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge proponent of dropping students, not in a callous way, uh, but when we drop students versus delaying it and trying to give people more time, I think I think this semester alone, we saw something like a 60 plus percent re-registration rate. Right, like, like they got the message, right? So just wanted to share that. Carrie, if you want to chime in just from the financial aspect of we, we, you, Carrie, especially, I can hear F bomb next to my office when we're not doing, you know, our, you know, our part centrally when it comes to job to not banter. Go ahead, Carrie. Thanks, President Maduco. Uh, CT State and the legacy 12 uh, colleges before that. And increasingly over time had difficulty collecting all of the student revenue. And uh, despite declining enrollments, the amount of uncollectible accounts from students was in, uh, increasing rapidly. And uh, it takes a year for that debt to mature and we have to write it off our books. But just for context, in the last fiscal year, in excess of $10 million is uncollectible, meaning we have to write it off our books in this current fiscal year. So one of the strategies to convert students into payers is to drop them. So we hope they re-enroll. We want to have a robust communications campaign with them and get them to re-enroll and pay, right? Um, so this has been an ongoing challenge. I'm happy to work with the group and explain a little bit more about how the finance team supports this work. But uh, it is one of the significant and contributing factors into our deficit is that we do not collect the, the revenue that students owe us for the classes that they've enrolled. And so I think we've worked to standardize some of the elements of the drop for non-payment process, but certainly everything can always be improved. So uh, I'm happy to clarify that. And, and as well that uh, paper bills are now routinely mailed out because I think relying on TouchNet alone or some of the student emails is not always effective. It's that paper bill that triggers action. And Kara, can you share some of the figures in terms of the bad debt that we've been dealing with in the recent years? Yeah, I mean, at, at certain points, it, and it changes, it's fluid during the semester, but, you know, we were as high as $14 million in the past in bad debt. Uh, and that is crippling uh, our finances. And it's a significant contributing factor to why we have a deficit. Thank you, Carrie, for sharing that information. Um, President Maduco, uh, I, I heard Tamika Davis, Carrie Kelly would participate. Would, should we also in, uh, solicit um, Steve McDowell in those conversations? Yeah, Steve McDowell, um, Gail Barrett, um, who's our AVP uh, of Enrollment Services, um, aka our registrar as well. Um, I, I think there's so many touch points that are involved. I think our Dean's Council, so we have a Dean's Council that consists of our campus deans and Obviously, they're the ones that are leading the charge in our campuses. So I think there's just there's so many stakeholders that have a, a slice of this that I think the insight is necessary for us to put everything on the table and just make just make an assessment on, you know, and maybe we don't know what other people are doing to it. And I get a sense of that as well. So so I, I, I do think it'd be helpful to put more eyes on this. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let's see. I have Sandra and then John, and then we're going to go ahead and vote folks. Sandra. Okay. Just quickly. Um, I want to let you know that president Maduco and Kerry, I appreciate, I don't feel like. This is not being heard anymore. I appreciate you listening and giving us the facts. And I know we can do better. I know we can, and I appreciate everything. And John, you're our last speaker on this issue. Oh, geez, I hope what I have to say is helpful. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just, I wonder since, um, you know, we listed all these people that could be involved in this conversation, it seems like it's a really significant issue. Is this something that's bigger than um, the council? 
Uh, is this something that would be better served by a focus group that isn't working on other council uh, student activity or student services council issues? Like, do we want to have a dedicated team to this, or do you think that this is still a good fit for? Well, the the motion was uh, staff council and other interested members. So we did broaden it so that folks who have experience in this area can join John. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great, but that would essentially like if with so many people effectively, maybe doubling the size of. The council meeting just to deal with this 1 topic. I just wonder if it's a. If it's a bigger issue or not, I mean, you know, obviously I'm, I'm glad to take it on, but. I would just want to make sure that um, that's the right body. I think that um, I'll come to you next, Sandra, but if the group were to decide they needed something that they wanted to refocus, that they can come back at the next meeting and say, we, we really need a, a more focused committee. John, this is just a beginning point. Everything we do is let's get something started. If there's a better way to do it, we'll certainly consider that. Um, I do want to get us to a vote, folks. So Sandra and Angelo, and then we are going to vote on this issue. Just quickly, uh, John, I agree with Al. We'll put it under here as like a subtopic. If we feel it needs to be its own committee, we can bring it to the Senate. But right now, I think this is a great starting point. Thank you. And Angelo. And I'd like to add to what we heard from the um, um, staff portion of, of, of the, the issue, the, the faculty, uh, how be, being affected by this issue. Uh, we get students who are like approved late. They join the classroom late. Uh, they missed assignments. They're freaking out about what am I supposed to be doing? So it's really not just one side of the house being affected. It's the entire, the entire college. Uh, so yeah, this issue has to be um, dealt with very quickly, hopefully. All right, folks, if you support referring this to the staff council and other interested members, please raise your hands now. Please raise your hands now. I see that we have lost Senator in front of some folks names and we are only counting. Counting your vote if you're if you're. If you are a sitting senator, if it says S E N before your name, folks. John, how many? It's still moving around. Hold on. Okay. So we're at 34, but it looks like we have two senators that don't have center in front of their name. Three senators didn't so. 31. So we have 33 votes, but only 31. Or 34 votes, but only 31 by. But, but you know, they're senators. You're very confident, John. Or, um, uh, there you go. Bonnie is updated. Um, Michelle Nye. I did Michelle. add Senator on my name and I had to switch my phone so i don't know if it goes off but i've been voting the entire time okay I, yeah it does yeah. drop if you if you change, oh, if you change okay. your device okay oh, thank you oh, okay okay thank you for letting me know right. that. so we're at 34 we're at 34 okay thank you go ahead and lower your hands folks any opposed uh, Patrick, your hand is up, my friend, and I have a feeling you weren't. Thank you. Any opposed? No opposition. Thank you. Any abstentions? Any abstentions? Okay. This motion passes without objection or abstention. Thank you folks. Um, I just, I just need to remind sitting senators that you might think that that we know who you are, but when you change devices or, um. We, we need you to, to make sure and monitor your handles 
today we had almost 50 people attending in addition to senators. And so we have to sort this list. And the only way for us to sort it and count your vote is if you have Senator in front of your name, SEN in particular. It, um, it is really a critical element to making sure that that governance is working well and properly. All right, folks, it is 311. Miguel. Motion to adjourn. Any objections or abstentions? There are objections? I'm not asking for a vote or for, for yeses. Nick wants to hang on the line. I was going to send that. I second. <laughs> very good. Uh, thank you all very much. Have a great spring semester, and I will see you in February. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Thank, Bye, you. Everybody. thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Have a good meeting. Meeting. everyone. Have a blessed one. Thanks. Bye, everyone.